Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take their questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. It's 1-855-450-NOAH. Or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this evening. Hey, I want to talk about our feedback segment. It is the first segment of every show, and it's because we want to answer your questions. To do that, we need you to write in to live at asknoahshow.com. So there are two things I want to point out here. One is if you are a person that has a question, I invite you to send it to live at asknoahshow.com. But even if you don't have a question, if you hear something and you hear me answer it and you say, hey, there's a better solution for that person. Well, I invite you to send that as well by sending an email to live at asknoahshow.com. And that's exactly where our first email comes in from Jeremy. I didn't have a great answer to Harvey's email last week, but Jeremy does. And he says, in response to Harvey's email, I use Sogo, a self-hosted email server, and it has fantastic functionality, including the ability to act as an exchange server over 443. But one of the functions is shared inboxes, which I believe would solve his problems. Our use we use it as part of a tiered mail package. However, I believe it could be used as a web client only installed in a separate machine. So you might want to check that out and uh, we'll have links for you in the show notes. And a huge thanks to Jeremy. So again, uh, if you'd like to join the program, 855-450-NOAH, it's 855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. But as you listen to the feedback segment, as you, if you have a way to contribute, I think one of the, my, the most exciting things about the show, and honestly not something I had an initially thought about when I started the program back in 2017 was, oh right, there's this massive community and there is a massive wealth of knowledge uh, in all of them. So if somebody has a question, oftentimes the best answer comes from the community. And huge thanks to Jeremy for reaching out. Our second email comes in from Keith. Keith writes in and says, hey Noah, I wanted to get your opinion on a cloud backup solution. And if I can encrypt my data before doing so, how would I do that? I've heard a few tech podcasts and they talk often about Backblaze. But when I looked into them, I noticed they didn't have a Linux client to back up their solution. Any recommendations? for backing up to Backblaze or another cloud-based solution that you may know of. So I'll be honest with you, Keith, off the top of my head, I don't know of, of, uh, of a good way to back up to Backblaze. Um, not something I come across a whole lot. There are some other cloud-based solutions that you might consider if you're wanting to go with a cloud-based. But to answer your first question, can you use encryption to locally encrypt your files and then send them up to the cloud for safe storage? And the answer to that question is kind of both yes and no. And I say it's both yes and no because it kind of depends on what your expectations of privacy are. If you're going to take the approach of a normal person, a normal person that is willing to take reasonable risks and they're going to do the best they can, but they're not high, you know, it's not Edward Snowden snuggling documents out of the NSA. It's like my tax returns, you know, they're, at the end of the day, the, the IRS has a copy of them anyway, right? Um, if that's your use case, then local encryption and sending up to the cloud is perfectly fine and very secure and, and there's nothing to worry about. And so in, in that event, if you wanted to go that route, what I would suggest, there's you have a couple of options here. The first uh, oldest, most reliable, and easy to wrap your head around way is just to use GPG. And so you can encrypt the file with GPG and it essentially takes the file, places it inside of a little wrapper, an encrypted wrapper, stores your data with encryption, and then you can send the encrypted file wherever you want. Later down the road, you pull it back down, you run GPG against it, you decrypt the data, it pulls it out of its little encrypted wrapper and hands you back your file. So that is the most straightforward way to go. Now, if you wanted to get a little more complicated, if you wanted to get a little more robust, you might consider looking at something like Veracrypt. Veracrypt is a iteration on 
was it TrueCrypt? It is the next uh, way of essentially it creates a container and it's a cross-platform piece of software that creates that container. And so then you can mount that container on Veracrypt on any operating system and your data is there. The other thing that Veracrypt does that's kind of neat is it supports something called hidden, uh, uh, hidden, um, I forget what they call it, hidden vaulted encryption, something like that. And the idea is this, you go and set up your actual encrypted drive and you use your actual encryption password. You put your actual data in there. And then after that, you create a second encryption vault and this vault you give a fake password to, a second password. I guess it's a real password, but it's, it's not the one that we care to use to secure our real data. And you place some incriminating looking data in that drive, but it's not the real data that you actually care about. In the event that an attacker comes at you because so here's the here's the logic here's the, the the problem i guess i should back up a little bit the problem is no matter how complicated sophisticated and reliable the encryption technology is the old joke is you can break any encryption method in about five minutes if you have the right size hammer and access to the person's fingers right uh, this is the, that's the politest way i can say of like somebody can force you to give up your password right so Veracrypt gets around even that problem by having this fake vault that has a fake password. And you put fake data in there, and in the event that somebody comes to you and says, you have to unlock this vault, you say, okay, here's my encryption password. Boom, there it is. It falls. And, but all, the only thing that ever shows is the false data. And they claim that there is no way to tell that there is a real partition with real data behind it. So Veracrypt is a way you could go. The third way is to use... Uh, IncFS or CryFS. Both of these are container-based encryption technologies. They actually come stock with KDE. So if you have the KDE desktop, if you go down on the on your on your um on your taskbar, you'll see a little folder icon with a padlock. And if you click on that, uh, vaults pops up. And then you get a button that says create new vault. You click on that, you give it a name, and you get to choose a file system of CryFS or IncFS. And so that would be the, the, those would be the three easiest ways I can think of to get this done for you. And so if you want to go that route, um, once you have your data in, in one of those three encryption technologies, then you can feel fairly comfortable sending that data up to the cloud. And it really doesn't matter which server you store the data on because at the end of the day, it's encrypted and only you have the key. And unlike some other technologies or unlike some other services that say that they encrypt the data, but they encrypt it. So they have the key. In this case, you're encrypting it locally. So that's not the case. Now, if you said to yourself, self, I would like to have my backups on the cloud, but I would really like to support a company that isn't, that is for privacy. You might consider something like Spider Oak or uh, Tarsnap. Now, both of these, well, let's, let's start with Spider Oak. Spider Oak is a encryption technology where it actually does encrypt on the local device and then sends up to Spider Oak, and they have a Linux client. They, they're, they're very well supported. My co-host Steve uses Spider Oak with great success and loves it. The other one is Tarsnap, and Tarsnap is in, is backup for the for the truly paranoid. And so essentially, um, again, like Spider Oak, they give you the private key and they allow you to create your backup and then send it up. So even Tarsnap doesn't have access to your data. Additionally, Tarsnap publishes their 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 source code, so you can go and view the source code that they're using to run their service. Uh, and, and finally, they use deduplication, so only the unique data is actually sent up to them, which lowers the amount of time it takes to, do, to run a backup. And so the, the, the pricing is pretty simple. It's 25 cents per gigabyte. And um, yeah, Tarsnap has been around for a long time. They have a long track, his, tra track record of treating people very well. So I might suggest you go with one of those services if you're looking to back up your data in a privacy respecting way. I would also shameless self plug, uh, Altispeed Technologies offers backup services. Now ours are primarily catered towards businesses, um, but if you have a true NAS appliance and um, you are willing to use ZFS replication, we have a backup service for you for that. So you can inquire at sales at altispeed.com if you are interested in that. But it sounds like you're doing it for personal use. Our third email comes in from Zach. Zach writes in and says, hi Noah. Keep it coming, great stuff. I'm curious as to what you choose for PDF software. I've never found one with good editing abilities and I've always had to fall back on Acrobat. Unfortunately, 
Are there any good open source solutions which could be used in a business environment that can do editing and signing? Also, we do sign our PDF reports to our client, and sometimes we currently use self-signed certs. This is fine, but it presents warnings to other users when opening. The main key source, GlobalSign, wants $350 a year to get a certificate to sign PDF documents. Is there anything that might work here, like Let's Encrypt, I wish? So I've not seen anything, and I'll be honest with you, I know next to nothing about PDF certificates. It's just not something I encounter in my day job uh, or my personal life. So I, I really can't be much help to you. But much like we had last week um, with Harvey, who called in and asked about, uh, uh, with uh, Harvey, who called in and, and asked about his email question, uh, there's somebody out here listening that knows all about PDF certificates, and that person is frantically writing an email right now to help you out. So I'll deliver that as soon as it arrives in my inbox. But as far as what software I use, honestly, 90% of the time, and I would be remiss if I didn't start here, I use Ocular because it's an open source program. It works great. Now, it doesn't have a lot of editing capabilities, and I know that that's what you're looking for, so I'm going to help you. But I would be remiss if I didn't start with Ocular. Great piece of open source software, probably one of the best uh, open source PDF viewers out there and has inverted uh, color scheme for uh, so that you can apply dark mode when the document isn't hashtag everything has to be dark mode or I go blind. So Ocular is a great piece of software and if you're not looking for extensive editing capabilities, Ocular is a great one. But if you need to do a lot of editing, we recommend all the time to our clients a uh, piece of software called PDF Studio. And PDF Studio is an easy to use, full feature PDF editing software. It's reliable, uh, it's inexpensive compared to some other pieces of software out there and provides all the functions you need uh, at a fraction of the cost to get PDF editing up and running. Um, you have the opportunity to create PDFs, you have the opportunity to scan to PDF, it supports OCR, it supports uh, annotating and markup. Uh, there's precision measuring tools built in. It has the ability to fast sign. You can fill in and save PDF forms. You can create secure documents, advanced PDF splitting and merging. You can create a watermark headers. You can put footers in there. Uh, they have document storage integration, DocuSign integration, and supports the new PDF 2.0 standard. They also have a pro version, and with that, they give you an interactive form builder, a content editing for both text and videos, an enhanced content explorer. They provide some redaction tools. Uh, they allow you the opportunity to sanitize your PDFs, overlay and compare PDFs, optimize PDFs, digitally sign PDFs, uh, batch process multiple PDFs, you can tag PDFs for accessibility, um, and a whole host of other features. But the thing that I like most about PDF Studio is it runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux, and so it's completely cross-platform. It is not open source, so I should point that out. Not an open source piece of software, which in my book means that it's a placeholder for the day that I can find a piece of open source PDF software. But for right now, uh, I think it's the best one out there for Linux. And we have some clients that are using this in a very, de we'll call it a very demanding environment. They're the kind of people or the kind of customer that doesn't have a lot of room for failure. They do also offer a free version. So if you're looking for uh, the if you're looking for something inexpensive or you just want to try it, they do offer it for free. But I think the pro version is like $99. No, I'm sorry. The standard version is $99. The the pro version is 139, but still, that's cheap for PDF software. I mean, I don't know if you've looked at some of the some of the competition out there, but will run natively on Linux. Does a fantastic job, and I really don't have a lot of uh, bad things to say about them. So I would check out PDF Studio. We'll have a link for you in the show notes. You can find those at podcast.asknoahshow.com. Our pick of the week is. There's not a name on here. Okay, so this is a, there's a, there's two parts to this. So I'm going to try and break this down. There's two parts to this. And what it is, is a back end that offers a surveillance system. So you're familiar with the Ring doorbell and you're familiar with um, these cloud-based services that have doorbells and cameras that you put inside of your home and on your home. And they're terrible from a privacy perspective. But they have one thing going for them, and that is convenience. It is super nice to be able to pick up a camera, stick it on the door, connect it to your net, and Bob's your uncle, you have camera feeds going to a nice cloud-based place that you can find them. And a lot of people like these for their lakes and their cabins and even some of their, you know, like you have a, a spare garage or a storage unit. All of these things 
seem like it's a great place to put a cloud-based camera. What if you wanted to do that, but you didn't want to use a cloud-based system, you wanted a secure way to send videos, and you wanted to self-host it? What would you do? Here's where this no-name project comes in. So there's two projects that have to be used together. Um, both are available. Code is available on uh, GitHub, but I think really what it was was a, a college's a project that a college put together. And so as, as a result, I don't know that there's an actual name for this thing that I think is really awesome and I'm trying to explain to you. So the, the back end is the surveillance camera controller and that runs on a Raspberry Pi. And so you, in, you, you, you install the software on to there and now you have a back end. Now for the front end, um, it actually will run a, like a, a web server also running on the Raspberry Pi, but allows you to, uh, have a little web interface to connect to that backend controller. And so the idea here is a secure and private self-hostable end-to-end encrypted cloud security camera using a Raspberry Pi. And what does it think using underneath to do the transport? Matrix! So they were looking for a way to send an encrypted stream from point A to point B and thought, well, we need an encrypted communications protocol. What are we going to use? Matrix. Uh, so the idea of this prototype project was to provide a similar functionality of commercial services like Ring or Nest, but without letting the noisy third party get inside your home. So I'll have a link to this fantastic project, which doesn't have a name, at podcast.asknoahshow.com, and you can check the show notes out there. Our gadget of the week is the Zima board. So the Zima board is one of these small little... Uh, uh, single board computing, uh, or computers, I should rather, I should say. And what is, uh, what is unique about this, first, let's start at the cost. It is $119, which is pretty cool. Um, and they sell it for using as a home server, as a hardware router, uh, or as what they call edge intelligence. And it is a, um, it's, it's designed out of the, uh, from, from the ground to be a hackable machine. So it's a low-cost single board ex uh, computer exclusively designed for makers and geeks. It has the expandability of an x86 board, um, but also the appropriate power of a microserver. So it has an Intel Core CPU, quad-core CPU with the 2.2 gigahertz, a dual gigabit Ethernet LAN, and you can run Windows, Linux, now get this, Open WRT and PF Sense. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So I have numerous times come across uh, situations in where you want to run PF Sense, but you don't want to bring along an entire PC to do so. Now, if you're willing to buy a NetGate device, they sell the NetGate 1100. It's a great little device, but it's about the size of like two card uh, decks stacked on top of one another. Um, but it sells for $200, and the only thing you can run on it is PFSense. This is $119, has a quad-core CPU at 2.2 gigahertz. It has dual gigabit LAN in it, and you could run PFSense, you could run OpenSense, you could run OpenWRT. To be fair, they don't specifically advertise uh, OpenSense, um, but if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's a little plain PC, I, I would assume that there'd be no reason you couldn't. Um, and this thing is specifically designed for personal servers. So it's specifically designed to be used as a personal NAS, to be used as a VPN server, to be used as a streaming device, a software router, a media center, or a smart home centralization hub. Um, and uh, again, 119 bucks, and they have a guide on how to install PFSense. So this little thing uses six watts of power, comes pre-installed with Casa OS with the onboard 32 gigabytes of eMMC storage and runs PFSense. So I am strongly considering picking a little one of these guys up to replace as my travel router. I currently have a GI net little travel router that I take and the whole reason I have that is it runs OpenVPN and then when I get somewhere I have the opportunity for it to just connect back home and uh, and be able to monitor and keep an eye on, on, on what's going on and access to all of my resources. So with this, I'd be able to do the same thing, but I'd also have all of the power and flexibility that comes uh, with PFSense. So the board is called the Zima board, and you can learn more at zimaboard.com. Of course, as always, we'll have a link for you in the show notes. You'll find those at podcast.asknoahshow.com. In our news segment, so we don't have a Linux Newswire this week because 
uh, my producer, Q5Sys, is on his way back, or actually just arrived, back home from Southeast Linux Fest. And we're going to give you a rundown of Southeast Linux Fest coming up later in the program, so don't miss that. But as a result, he didn't have an opportunity to put a newswire together. So I'm back to the news. In the first news story headline, how federal government buys our cell phone data, source EFF.org. So, Data brokers, quote, data brokers and federal military intelligence and law enforcement agencies have formed a vast secretive partnership to surveil the movements of millions of Americans. Many mobile apps on our cell phones track our movement with great precision and frequency. And data brokers then harvest our location data from that app developers and sell it to these agencies. Now you might ask yourself, where is this data coming from? Which apps, which agencies, which data brokers? Quote, Weather apps, navigation apps, coupon apps, and quote unquote family safety apps, Life360, often request data or location access to enable key features. But once an app has location access, it typically has free reign to share that data with just about anyone. Uh, data brokers entice the apps developers with cash for data deals, often paying per user for direct access to their device. Developers can add bits of code called software development kits, also known as SDKs, from location brokers into their apps. And once installed, a broker's SDK is able to gather data whenever the app itself has access to it. Sometimes that means access to location data whenever the app is open. In other cases, it means background access to data whenever the phone is on, even if the app is closed. So if you want to find out why someone does something, my advice is look for the money. Where are they getting money from and look at how much it is and chances are you can pretty much tell why somebody is doing something. And if you want to find out why something isn't be being done, look at how much it costs and chances are the reason that it's not being done is money. People are primarily money driven. They're, we're, we're just money driven features because money is the lubrication that helps you through society. So I'm not here to badmouth businesses for a way of making money. I'm not here to badmouth any particular business or cast shame on them for making money, for doing something that is perfectly legal. And it is perfectly legal for them to sell the data thanks to third party data doctrine law. Third party data doctrine law specifically says that there is a legal doctrine that allows people who voluntarily give up the information to third parties such as banks and phone companies and internet providers, uh, email service providers, at that point they no longer have a reasonable expectation of privacy to that information because if they did they wouldn't have given it to that third party in the first place. Okay. Either you're keeping something private or you're not keeping something private. And this is the way that the, that, that, that the courts are going to look at this. And it comes as a shock to a lot of people that Verizon Wireless sells data to other places. But that's what happens because they can make money doing that. And for, in fact, Verizon in specific makes more money off of selling data from people than they make off of actually selling the service to you. So that what they're doing is not a crime. What they're doing is not illegal. It's a privacy nightmare, but it isn't illegal. And so these companies are aligned for a paycheck. And the, the, the part that does bother me, while I wouldn't cast shade on them for doing something that is perfectly legal, I, will, I personally wouldn't do business with the company. I wouldn't support a company. I'm actually, and I'm, the rest of this segment, I'm gonna start tearing them apart. For, for not acting in your client's best interest. If somebody gives you their hard earned money, it's because they're paying you for a service and they want you to serve them, that is what service is all about. And so when you do that, when you, you, when you, when you open up your hand and offer a service and then go behind their, behind their back and do this thing, you're not serving them well. And companies know darn well that people wouldn't be comfortable with this because if they didn't think that were the case, they would be more upfront and honest about what they're doing with the data. Why don't they just have a pop-up when you open the app that says, hey, in order, this app is free. And the way it's free is because we sell your data to the FBI and anybody that comes knocking for it. So if you're not comfortable with that, here's a paid tier. Here's what would it cost to use our app. Or here's the thing if you're uncomfortable with it, opt out. And they know darn well that people would either not use the app and say, well, that's creepy. Or they would just, they, I think a lot of more people than they give credit would just pay to, to use the thing. Cause, but, but instead they, they obscure it, they hide it and they come up with privacy policies that just dance around the truth and then ultimately make money off of selling people's data behind their back. And I think that's wrong. Um, 
a handful, quote, a handful of companies sell to action-oriented clientele. So I'll back up and, 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 and give a little background here. So up until this point, we're just talking about a commercial enterprise, right? So the, they, they collect all this information and they sell it to the highest bidder. And if the government wants to pay for it, so, so be it. But a handful of companies, quote, sell to action-oriented clientele. That is to say the federal government, law enforcement, military, intelligence agencies, defense contractors, over the past year, a cadre of journalists have gradually uncovered details about the clandestine purchase of location data by agencies with the power to imprison, kill, or intensely secretive companies who sell it. Keyword, intensely, intensely secretive. These companies know what they're doing isn't going to be popular and isn't going to be accepted by, by most people. And so it goes from a privacy nightmare to a legal nightmare. When, 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 when Life360 collects your data on, on its app and then sells it to an insurance company, that's a privacy nightmare. It's kind of a pain. When they go and start selling it to the FBI or immigration services or local law enforcement you know, or a defense contractor, now it's going to a legal problem and it's going to a legal nightmare. And that's even worse. Once you give your information over to somebody or something else, you lose it. And the problem that we have is, and I've absolutely experienced this and so have you, you pull out your phone, you go to install an app that you have to have for one reason or another, or you're, okay, I won't say have to have, you're strongly needing to have this app so that you can accomplish a particular task or participate in a particular thing. You download the app. As soon as it pops up, it asks you for location service. And you say to yourself, what in God's green earth does this app need with location service? And I will tell you a, 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 a specific thing that happened with a specific app that I think is absolutely ridiculous. So I, uh, I, I, I play drums. It's my musical instrument. And I wanted a wrist uh, metronome that I could use if, in, in the event that I didn't have access to, to my regular metronome so I could play with the click track. And I came across a company called uh, Soundbeamer. And uh, Soundbreener has what they call the Pulse, which is a little wristwatch mounted metronome, okay? So this is, it's a wrist mounted circle that vibrates at a consistent pattern and you can change how often that is, all right? So the thing comes and I realize that you need an app to control it. Okay, fine, they have different vibration patterns, they have different light intensities, they have, you know, you can set it up for four, four and three, four and triplets and all the things. All right, fine, I need an app. So go and download the app wants access to location data. Absolutely not. I'm going to pair you with a stupid Bluetooth thing and then I'm probably going to uninstall the app on my phone anyway. You don't need to, my location data. So I deny it. Nope, app is just isn't going to run. App isn't going to run. An app to tell the thing how often to pulse a vibrating thing can't run unless it has access to my location data? Are you kidding me? So if you wake up in that boat you pay $97 for this stupid thing, it arrives, what do you do? You put it back in the box and send it off and say, I'm not going to use it. I will make that choice because I'm a principled person and that kind of stuff drives me nuts and I want a company like that to burn to the ground. I run, not walk in the opposite direction. But a lot of people are in a position where they want to see the pictures of their kids. They want to see the drawings of their kids when they're at school. They want, there's so many things that are hidden behind apps nowadays, and the apps are required if you want to participate in those things. And yes, it's fantastic and sounds good and makes great promotional and marketing material when Apple can say, we care about privacy. Look, we entered this little thing that allows you to uh, approve or deny the location data. And I've seen in Google, or excuse me, in Android, now anytime it's requesting access to the microphone, phone or location, stuff like that. It'll put the little dot there to tell you that, hey, this is what's happening. That's great. That's all fine and well. But why, if nothing else, why don't you, if you really want to impress my, with your privacy protection, here's an idea. Lie to the app on behalf of me. Why don't you, Apple, make the location data when I say don't allow, instead of telling the app that I didn't allow location data, why don't you lie to the app and say that I did give you access to location data and oh, by the way, I live in Cupertino, California at Apple's headquarters, right? You're funneling all the VPN traffic from uh, from uh, High Sierra, or, uh, 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 whatever the latest version of Mac OS is, in, back to uh, Apple, if you can do that on your MacBooks, why not just lie about the location data? That seems like a much easier thing to lie about and would allow those apps to run.
But this this false facade of we are going to deny location, we're going to give you the option to turn it on or off, and we're going to let you know which apps are asking for it. What good does it do if I can't actually turn it off? If the app stops working when I turn it off, it does me no good. Once you give an app that, that permission, you lose control. And then they have the opportunity to sell it to law, law enforcement, government agencies, and there's nothing you can do about it. Quote, the vendor that we know the most about is Ventil. It's a subsidy of the commercial agency Gravy Analytics. And its current and former clients in the U.S. include government agencies such as the IRS, DHS, subsidies of the of, of ICE, uh, Customs and Border Protection, the DEA, and the FBI. So there you have it. Uh, your government is paying and get, getting together with private companies to collect your data and store it. Canine Mail is to become Thunderbird from Android. So this comes to us from blog.thunderbird.net. Quote, for years we've wanted to extend Thunderbird beyond the desktop and the path to delivering the great Thunderbird on Android experience started in 2018. That's when Thunderbird released product manager Ryan Lee Sipes first met up with Christian Ketter, uh, a.k.a. C. Ketty, the project maintainer for the open source Android email client Canine Mail. The two initially wanted to find a way for the two projects to collaborate. Through the following few years, the conversation evolved into how to create an awesome seamless email experience across platforms. But Ryan and C. Kitty both agreed that the final product had to reflect the shared value of both projects. It had to be open source. It had to respect the user, and it had to be a perfect fit for power users who crave customization and a rich feature set. Ultimately, Sipe says, it made sense to work together instead of developing a mobile client from scratch. And to that end, we're thrilled to announce today that Canine Mail will officially join the Thunderbird family, and C Kitty has already joined the full-time, has already joined the Thunderbird staff as a full-time staff member, bringing his valuable expertise and experience with the mobile platform. That means that the name itself will change and adopt Thunderbird branding. Before that happens, we need to reach a certain development milestone that will bring Canine Mail into alignment with Thunderbird's feature set and visual appearance. To accomplish that. We'll devote finances and development time to continually improving Canine Mail, and we'll be adding new brand features and introducing quality of life enhancements. So, I would submit to you that Canine Mail is today probably the most popular email client for open source people on mobile. It's fantastic. And I used Canine Mail right up until I switched over to Blue Mail. And the only reason I switched to Blue Mail as my mobile email client was for one feature and one feature only. And I really, the fact that they're teaming up with Thunderbird is more than enough to convince me to come back. But the feature that I was looking for is uh, the ability to snooze an email. So all too often, the following situation happens. I pull out my phone, I see that I have an email, I think to myself, I need to get back to that person. And then I put the phone in my pocket, and what happens? I completely forget that that ever happened, because I have the memory of a goldfish. I can't help it. Um, so Blue Mail has a unique feature that I've not seen in any other mail client, which is uh, you can swipe uh, left if you want to delete the message, or you swipe right, and it, 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 uh, it snoozes the message. And so it ta removes it from the inbox as if it was gone. Um, doesn't actually do anything on the back with IMAP. So it's not actually gone, it's just kind of hidden from the mail client view. And then uh, whatever the snooze time you set, so mine is four hours, four hours later, it comes back as another email. Um, and I, I love that feature. Uh, so, but I could live without it. And frankly, I'm more excited to see what kind of other features, maybe to include that one, that Thunderbird on mobile is going to happen. But I got to tell you, I switched over to using Mozilla on my, on my cell phone for uh, my web browser and I could not be happier with it. So I continue to think that uh, Mozilla specifically and, um, and, uh, and, 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 Thun and the new Thunderbird uh, are, are doing a fantastic job. And so if you're interested, it's important that these projects aren't funding themselves. It requires us to participate. And so if you're one of the people that say to yourself, man, I really want to see this, uh, I want to see this come about. So how do I do that? Well, you would want to financially support them. And so you can for, uh, support them by going to mzla.link slash canine dash give. 
That is mzla.link slash canine dot or dash give. And we'll have a link for you in the show notes located at podcast.asknoahshow.com. And finally, in the news, Element Call 2, or Element Call is finally in Beta 2. So this comes from Matrix.org, and everything is, so they've made a number of different, a number of improvements that I'm excited about. The first of which is that everything is now end-to-end encrypted by default. So end-to-end encryption was always possible, it was always available in uh, Element Call, but they had previously turned off encryption by default for the purpose of troubleshooting. It is absolutely impossible to collect metrics and do troubleshooting if you can't see what's happening. And indeed, when you turn on encryption, because encryption is uh, done correctly, you can't see much of what the user's doing. Um, there's also experimental support for spatial audio. And so this the idea here is to get people immersed in their video call so they feel like they're actually on the other end of whoever it is they're talking to. And as a person who just spent over a week in Charlotte, North Carolina, where they tried to kill me with humidity, I had the opportunity to continue to have a relationship with my kids thanks to Element Call. Um, and so the concept of spatial audio uh, really appeals to me in that sense. I don't know that I really care much about it for things like work meeting, which I suspect is what the vast majority of people would use Element Call for. But if that's something that's interesting to you or if that's something that's useful to you, it is a new feature. And finally, one of the things I'm most excited about, I think I've mentioned this on the program before, walkie talkie mode is now here. So this is a push to talk mode that allows you to start with uh, video being disabled and everyone is muted by default. And then if you want to speak, you press, uh, you, you you use the push to talk. And they've done testing with a hardware push to talk device. So if you wanted to pair it with an actual device, uh, so you have an actual button, you certainly could do that. And I think this is, uh, I think this is really fantastic. I think there's a lot of uh, construction companies. There's a lot of uh, service industries. Pretty much every shuttle van I've ever seen at a hotel or at a transport service, all of them are using some sort of push to talk technology. And so the fact that Element Call is doing this, I think is absolutely fantastic. Uh, actually, I lied to you. I have two more stories. Um, Mo- headline, Mozilla enables Firefox total cookie protection by default. And so this comes to us from 9to5linux.com. Quote, total cookie protection protects your privacy by confining cookies to the website where they're created. This prevents tracking companies from using the said cookies to track your browsing activities as you navigate across multiple websites. The privacy was first enabled by default on Firefox only when you switched on the web browser's privacy mode. But as of today, the anti-tracking feature is now enabled by default for Firefox uses on desktop platforms such as Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. This is applied worldwide without toggling anything or affecting their web browsing experience. And then a quote from Mozilla themselves. By making totally total a cookie protection of the default for all users, Firefox is now leaving Chrome and Edge in the dust when it comes to privacy protection said Mozilla in a press release. Mozilla believes that while advertising is central to the internet economy, consumer privacy should not be optional. Cookie protection, total cookie protection, excuse me, works by creating a separate cookie jar for each website you visit instead of allowing trackers to link up your behavior on multiple sites. They just get to see the behavior on individual sites. So this is really cool. And again, I know that there's a lot of you out there that are using Brave. I know that there's a lot of out a lot of you out there that are upset with Mozilla for a variety of reasons. I know that there's a lot of you out there that are out of a job who used to work for Mozilla. I'm aware of all of that. I still maintain that if you're looking for a, a, a good, solid, private browser that has a lot of steam behind it, Mozilla is a fairly decent way to go. And my reaction as I use other parts of the internet and they break when I'm going through Mozilla, but they work in Chrome, is simply that that website and I, we're just not designed, we're just not going to hang out. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not them, it's me. Truly the last story. Uh, the KDE Project 525 is out. So the KDE Project announced today the, rele- the general release, uh, ah, geez, easy for me to say. They announced today the release and general availability of KDE Plasma 525 and the latest stable series of this beloved graphical desktop environment for Linux. 
four months in the making, KDE Plasma 525 Desktop Environment Series is here to introduce some exciting new features, such as full control of tablet mode with both Wayland and X11 sessions, finger, print, uh, finger following one-to-one -one touchpad gestures for touch-friendly devices, a configura configuration window for K-Runner, as well as, get this, a new floating mode for the KDE panel that detaches from the bottom to look more like a dock. If I had one complaint about KDE, which is easily the most customizable desktop out there, in my humble opinion, it's that there was no elegant way to have a dock. And so every time somebody asked me about it, I would tell them to install Latte Dock. And Latte Dock is good, but the problem is because it's not a native thing, everything else in the, in the operating system isn't really aware of it. And so, for example, if you just by default enable Latte Dock, it's going to put both the panel and Latte Dock in there. So the ability to create a, a floating panel that detaches and looks more like a dock, I think is a fantastic idea. Um, KDE 525 also comes complete with a rewrite of bo both present windows and the desktop grid uh, for automatic synchronization of accent colors with the desktop wallpaper. So this is kind of the whole idea. Unity had something similar to this, right? When you changed the background, it would just subtly change the little accent colors for the transparency thing that, that, that overviewed it. And it just brought a more cohesive overall feel um, to the desktop. It has a new smooth crossfade effect when changing between the old and new color schemes. And there's also uh, support for configuring the buttons of the Wacom Express key on remote devices, the ability to access and manipulate plasma layouts assigned to other screens from a central location with the global edit mode toolbar. And a new crashed processes viewer app as well to detect parts of the desktop layout that you that you would want to change during a global theme system settings. In addition to KDE, Plasma, they now feature a user feature, feature touch mode that turns on whenever the screen is detached or rotated 360 degrees. So you see a lot of these two-in-one devices that uh, Dell is making and, and others, and it lets you edit the schemes to make the accent colors subtly tint all of the colors to automatically be generated based on the color of your current desktop. Uh, for the Plasmon Wayland session, KDE 525 improves the multi-finger touchscreen gestures and the slides gestures to switch between virtual de desktops. And so you can follow your fingers and follows the user experience for gamers uh, by disabling the screen edges action and adds the ability to change the screen resolution to resolutions beyond what are officially supported. Um, so all in all, it's great. I am going to be uh, playing with this. Uh, if you are looking for a way to play with KDE, uh, I, would ch I would suggest checking out KDE Neon. And so KDE Neon is the KDE desktop on top of Ubuntu. And you get a lot of people that say, well, why wouldn't I just use Kubuntu? And the, the, the reason for that is, and I'll have a link for you for, to, for, to uh, neon.kde.org. The reason for that is KDE Neon is specifically for playing with and testing um, KDE, whereas the rest of it is, or Kubuntu is its own actual distribution. And so if you want to play with the latest version of KDE, you don't want anything else other than the latest version of KDE, I would check out KDE Neon. It's a great way to to play with it. Um, past that, if you have uh, a, a regular install, of course, you could choose to install uh, KDE and, and use it that way. Another Southeast Linux Fest is in the books. 2022 wrapped up on Sunday with a bang and a huge thank you to everyone from Jeremy Sands, the benevolent dictator of Southeast Linux Fest, to the entire team that puts Southeast Linux Fest on, all the way uh, down through the volunteers that help, uh, that, that actually make the fest happen, down to you who come and participate. And when I say down, I'm starting with the people most necessary uh, to put the conference on, not in order of value, because of course the conference is there from a value perspective because of you, the attendees. If you didn't come, there would be no reason to put it on. Um, so during the speaker dinner, uh, Jeremy has a line, many of you come on your own time, many of you come on your own dime. And the uh, idea there is when you see these really talented people, people like Alan Hicks and people like uh, Zach Underwood who come and speak on a variety of different topics, uh, these people oftentimes are not being paid by their organizations to come. 
they just show up because they want to share their wealth of knowledge with the rest of us. And I tell you what, every year, every year without fail, I find myself on my knees at the feet of great technically experienced people who, and I just shut up and I listen. And I learn, and this year I started something new. I actually created a markdown doc called Self 2022. And every time I started to get into an interesting conversation with somebody and they just started rattling off pieces of information, I pulled my laptop out and I started writing it down. And then I would go through and I'd ask questions, go do a little bit more research, kind of you know, enlighten myself on the subject, and then circle back and ask about it a little bit more. This year we tried something uh, with more of a family-friendly, non-alcoholic uh, focus on it. Um, and so, and I thought it went really well, and there was actually a couple of different areas at Self that did that, and it was actually a huge success. I don't have anything against people who want to drink copious amounts of alcohol. It just makes it really difficult if there's somebody stopping uh, people that are not 21 from getting through the door to take my 11-year-old, my 8-year-old, um, my kids. I can't do that. So uh, what's really fantastic about having family-friendly events at Self is there's an opportunity for families to do something. And we were, I was proud to be a part of, uh, of a team that led one of those efforts. So MindRip Media took over one of the uh, one of the one of the spaces and we did it was a two-part thing so Jeff Brooks and uh, JT took the the center stage up front and set up a number of different retro devices they called it the retro rag shoe and it was a really unique way to geek out so they took a 386 a 486 a PS2 a PS3 and maybe something else and they installed Linux on it or tried to and uh, some were successful and some were not but it brought out so much interesting discussion. So I was in the back of the room with a group of people and we just geeked out. We did everything. This started with a lot of us on our laptops, just showing one another, hey, here's what I use in production and here's how I get this done and I can't get this to work. Do you know why this doesn't work? And, and here's a piece of technology I've always wanted to get my head around. Does anybody know how to do this? And it was just this incredible experience of sharing and contributing and hanging out and building relationships with other people. Other people to where you're not the smartest person in the room. And a lot of us suffer from that. You know, we work at our day jobs and everybody comes to us for the technical answers. How do I fix this? How do I do that? And there's nobody for us to really escalate to. There's no one for us to really sit down and just geek out with. Uh, and so self provides that where there's people that are like, a million times above my level and then there's people that are literally just starting out on Linux and I absolutely had some of those people come up to the booth and say hey can you show me how to flash a flash drive with an ISO can you show me how to uh, fix why this doesn't work we had a young lady that came and um, was in her 20s never had heard or touched Linux before and left there with Linux on her laptop she came in with Windows 10 or 11 on her laptop and left with a fresh copy of uh, Kaman 2.22.04. So that absolutely happens and I, I need to go get more stickers that say Noah switch me to Linux. In fact, I was, we were joking, um, we we're gonna go get, get uh, little water uh, tattoo things that say Noah switch me to Linux and wait for all of the people that get like plastered and pass out and then go and put them on their forehead. <laughs> but uh, so, so, so we're, we're in this, we're in this, uh, in this room trying to install Linux on a number of these different devices. And there's this conversation going on in the background and one of the devices isn't able, we're not able to install Linux on it because you can't boot it because it needs to be connected to the internet so that it can talk to its cloud service. Well, guess what didn't exist anymore, so guess what we weren't doing. Um, so that piece of technology is essentially bored. We couldn't use it. And it brought up an interesting discussion you couldn't install Linux on one on this PlayStation because it didn't have an active internet connection and its respective cloud service. So what really is the best way forward technologically speaking? On one hand, we could choose to lock things in place. Just everything stays as it is and we never really have innovation and we don't move to cloud and, and all of the things. We just keep things as they are. And if we did that, then nothing would change and everything would conceivably work forever. The problem is innovation doesn't stop, right? So it's kind of a ridiculous idea because it's like trying to put toothpaste back in a tube. Once it gets out of the bottle, it's here to stay. You can't put a genie back in the bottle. And if you start from that premise that we have to embrace technology and we have to embrace the change, then it leads to technology becoming more complicated over time. And so I had a friend at Self say to me, well, someday I'm going to be 60 and I don't want to be that grandpa that doesn't know how to use this technology. 
And so this continual rapid evolution of technology, I don't think it really serves the user well. And in some ways, I absolutely agree with that. If we installed an operating system made you know, in the 90s on a computer that was made in the late 80s, despite the fact that the computer's 40 years old, it still worked just fine. And I want you to look around you right now as you listen to this show. Look around to your immediate left and look around to your immediate right. And what devices are there that will still work 40 years from today? And how many of those pieces require an internet connection to be functional? So yes, technology is becoming more complicated, but I would argue, and I did argue, that what we're doing is we're beginning to obfuscate a lot of that a lot of that technological complication. There's this idea in the IT industry, and it's absolutely accurate. Keep it simple, stupid. The more simple something is, the longer it can be supported, and the easier time we have managing it. And so, if you use things like Ansible, if you use things like Chef, if you use things like Puppet, you can command and control a lot of these very complicated technologies in a very simple and straightforward way. When you need to dig into them, because all of those technologies are largely open source, you can dig into them as deep as you want. So, nobody's preventing you from looking down, but just like you might not know how the code on a microcontroller works, but you're able to send a print job to a printer, we are very much going to get there with things like microservices uh, and, 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 and all sorts of things. And so I think you just have to have a commitment to owning your technology, respecting your own privacy, and being will to, willing to teach yourself a new skill. And if you're willing to do those things, and if you're willing to hold those values, then you're, you have everything you need to make value-based decisions on technology. And I think that's a far more approachable, inviting, and somewhat encouraging way to look at the direction that the technology landscape is going. Yes, we have the rings of the world that are taking over. Yes, we have the Googles and the Apples and the cell phone providers that are taking over. All of that is absolutely true. But self reminds me, and the conversations that occur itself and the presenters that present itself all remind me that there absolutely is light at the end of the tunnel. And so I walked away from self this year feeling like my batteries were recharged. Like they'd, like they'd, they'd wound down over the past two years. And not because I cared any less about technology. It's absolutely not the case. I love it to death. It's just, I needed my people. And I got back with my people. So I hope you'll join us, Self 2023. We'll have a bigger presence there, more advertisers, or excuse me, more booths there, more presenters there. It's going to be even better. So join us, Self 2023, southkazinxfest.org to learn more. Hey, the music in my ears means we're out of time. If you like the show, follow us on Twitter at Ask Noah Show. Follow me at Colonel Linux. We record the show every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central at AskNoahShow.com. Have a good week. We'll see you next week.